thank you very much, all of you. Thank it you. has been a thank you. interesting day. I, my head is full of questions, and I can't <laughs> resist taking the chance to ask just to ask you uh, one or two things before I let the floor uh, step in here. And uh, I was thinking about you. You are so happy to maximize. Um, you maximize utilities, you maximize quality, you maximize welfare, etc. And I was thinking uh, that can be done if we know the utilities, if we know, have qualities or other numbers. But in healthcare, isn't it often so that our utilities are fuzzy? We are not really clear in our heads about how, what we prefer, etc. And there is another dilemma here, and that is that there are very many certainties. And if there are certainties and uncertain utilities, we can no longer maximize. You don't have that rule because it doesn't work. I'm just, am I missing something? Or do you, uh, you as utilitarians have a secret recipe for taking decisions under great uncertainty and value instability? I'm looking at you too, Torbjörn. Okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't think that the notions are so fuzzy, even though we could give, of course, in a philosophical discourse, different definitions of happiness and the qualia, uh, of course, is fairly well defined, but, but I'm not satisfied with the definition. So, so, I mean, there are many uncertainties relating to such things. Um, but... Um, and, and we have all these uncertainties about outcomes and so on. But, but, but still, uh, we hear the idea here that one should not try to uh, give uh, strict rules of how to do this. Rather, we should trust the people on the floor, the, the, the physicians, to, to rely on their, their professional expertise when they are setting priorities in this way. I think that happened at Karolinska University Hospital for a while and, and there was a lot of criticism against these doctors because there were suspicions that they, that they refused uh, patients from ICU beds uh, because they had prejudices or, or they made the wrong kind of, of, uh, of uh, priority setting. They, they, for example, relied on the age, biological age, but that was perhaps not okay. So I, I think it's a good idea here, even though you must be aware of the impossibility of doing this right, uh, do it as best you can. And, and even the intention to maximize happiness, I think, uh, is something that, should, if that is the idea, we should follow, then it should be made explicit. But we should be aware of the fact that we, we will fail. I mean, we will never reach the correct decisions or, or rarely reach the correct decisions. And when we do, it's a bit of a chance often. I don't know if that okay. is an answer to your no. question. <laughs> no, it is not. No. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I would simply say that we make this, this is a problem that goes throughout life, yeah. individually as well, right? Um, we can only go by probabilities. Um, that's, that's our guide. Uh, we can try to form an estimate of the probabilities of one course of action having better consequences than another. Um, but there are certainly, there are uncertainties. Um, as utilitarians, we to speak more technically, we want to maximize expected value rather than value. So we, let's say, have a choice between values A and B, um, but the probability that if we act in a certain way, we'll achieve uh, action A is greater than the probability that if we achieve action a, a B, and then we estimate the size of the values, and we discount that by the probabilities, and we end up with 
uh, expected utility, yeah. and, and that's what we should be trying Mike, to do. You're no, you an are. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> so I good, you know. <laughs> that's what I was aiming at, because if you are not certain about the probabilities and you are not certain about the utilities, you can't maximize because you cannot maximize over sets of uncertainties here. So then your system doesn't work. I don't understand, sorry, why can't you maximize expected utilities? You can ex you do it when you ha know the probabilities and you know the utilities, but in healthcare situations you might not even know them. And you might but, but you, you, When you say you don't know them, you mean there's, there's a, the range is from zero to 100% and okay, you have no uh, idea where in that range it falls? between 40 and 70. Okay, and already there you have a problem because there's no rule, because you can't maximize. So I was curious. But I think that? you could tease out the subjective probabilities, but okay. Doesn't help. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Ule. I can, can comment. I, I believe in having clear principles, yeah. recognizing that doctors and policymakers, they will interpret them differently and make, add sound judgment to those. But having clear principles uh, is helpful, I think. And I also believe that in medicine, there's a lot of uncertainty, but uh, medical doctors are good at, uh, at uh, making choice under uncertainty and take the, the example of COVID vaccines. We have big trials. We know that the vaccine saves deaths in 90% of the uh, there might be 88 or maybe 92 or so on but it's fairly precise and that's much better than not using this information. On qualis, Everyone agrees that they are not perfect. Um, in the Norwegian Commission, we said we used the term healthy life years, goelevor. We believe that living long lives with good quality is something everyone wants. And we want this as fairly distributed at the maximum level. And so we said, if there are better methods than qualis, please use them. But for now, that's the best we have. Yeah. I mean, one obvious problem with them is, I think, that you start with zero. You can't go below zero, but uh, as yeah. when we have discussed euthanasia and such topics, I mean, we know that uh, that misrepresents reality, really, that, that you... Yeah, so, so there are all sorts of problems yeah. with, with these measurements. Yeah, and as for uncertainty, I mean, especially with doctors, I mean, we have so many of them uh, while curing patients, and they don't stop... Uh, doctors to cure their patients, although they never know whether it would be 100% or 80 or um, or anything close. So utilitarians are just like that. Yes, we try. We all take risks. Um, um, utilitarians do in their decision making. Yeah, Ole, uh, you talk about qualities, and this is my final question or second question. Um, there was a European. Uh, union group or consortium on health economics and I quote quality assessment for healthcare decision making should be abandoned and um, yeah. it so has an uh, sorry it has had an impact on the member states yeah. this statement yeah and I know in Germany they don't want to use qualis. Uh, mm. And I think one of the re and, uh, one of the reasons is this dilemma that it seems to discriminate against the disabled. Uh, so I, I think this is a is a core uh, uh, challenge we as ethicists need to explore more. In my view, uh, that criticism is too harsh because doctors they are concerned about the probability of survival, the probability of improving the quality of life. So they are concerned about the exactly same things as qualis. So that criticism is more a, a, a criticism against this idea of only maximizing health. So my response, as I indicated earlier today, if you are concerned about those who are worse off, there's a trade-off here. So if, the, if you have a patient who's really worse off than others, and, uh, or, or if you can help one person a little bit and another one uh, um, more, but the one you can help a little bit is much worse than the other, depending on your trade-off, you might end up helping the disabled or, or the, the one with morbidity. Mm -hmm. But if you can... Uh, if if the, the benefit is huge, uh, the difference in benefit is huge, then you might end up with ma maximizing. But it's this trade-off uh, all the way. And I, I think viewing that issue uh, um, 
with these two objectives, um, then you you uh, you counter that criticism that you dis discriminate against the disabled. We, we always make choices with, uh, about uh, patients where you can help and who have different degrees of morbidity. Okay. I, I would say, um, you know, certainly as I agree with Tobion, we can improve the way in which we calculate qualities. But to say we should abandon it uh, leaves open the question uh, and replace it with what, right? I mean, if you're trying to decide as allocating healthcare resources uh, whether a new very expensive treatment which extends some people's lives for a relative, you know, let's say some months, um, whether that is worth going ahead with, given the resources. Um, if you don't use some measure of the benefits that you're getting from it, uh, I think you'll have less rational decisions than if you use an imperfect measure. So, yeah, let's, let's try and make it better, but I, I don't see it as a reason for abandoning it. Okay. Siobhan, if you want to say something, uh, raise your hand, and I, I hope I see it. Thank you, and uh, Gustav Arrhenius. Yeah, thank you. This is a question for Ole. Uh, I was fascinated to see uh, the first implementation of prioritarianism I ever seen or know about in the world. So congrats to that. Uh, here's an obvious question. I mean, uh, the weighting you used one, <coughs> two, and three, or was it one, three, and five? And I just wonder uh, how did you come up with the weighting and how did you justify it? So that was the first question. And then second, I wonder, have you tried to test whether your results? that is the recommendations, are st stable or robust under other things than qualities like DALIS or, or, or adjusting the qualities so they are less discriminatory against uh, people with disabilities. Because that's an easy way to proceed. Yeah. So you can see maybe it gives the same. It doesn't matter if you use other uh, uh, index. Mm. So what we did in, in that uh, government report, we, we just... We reviewed the literature on relative weights um, uh, for quality. There have been some uh, studies of aversion to inequality with experiments. So we reviewed the literature and came up with these weights one, two, three. It's obvious a simplification. We proposed this as a rule of thumb. And then we argued we'd need to do more studies, uh, finding out the shape of this marginal weighing function and the relative weights. And uh, that we could explore this with experts, with the polls and so on and get a reasoned discussion about the relative weight of a quality to someone who is worse off than others. That could obviously be, be applied to disability adjusted life years, the DALIS as well, I believe. And it would be interesting to explore that in, in real cases where you have these dilemmas. Uh, but if you think of the principles, I think it would show a clear difference in, in conclusions. Mm. Okay, so I have a question for Ole and uh, the mirror image question for the utilitarians. Uh, so Ole, you, <coughs> in Norway you have defined uh, severity quite precisely uh, in terms of absolute shortfall. Uh, and an implication of that is that you should care about lives as a whole, and that means that you should care about the past sometimes, right? Um, having it worse in the past matters for priority setting. So my simple question is, why should we care about the past? Why shouldn't we let bygones be bygones and just focus on what we can affect, namely the future? And my mirror image question to the utilitarians is, uh, doesn't it seem intuitive to care about, about lives as a whole? Um, why should we just care about the future i mean if you have had a rough time doesn't isn't it intuitively plausible to care about some idea about compensation for instance so yeah. if you want to start that, that's a complex question so my answer would be that what we proposed and my view is that if you think of this problem of allocating scarce resources as a um, problem for decision makers uh, d making decisions for society or a population. I think it makes sense to think of the whole life. And, and typically we will prioritize between interventions targeting different diseases or conditions. So 
um, prostatic cancer, breast cancer, there will be a different in life chances for these two groups. So that's the perspective of the whole life. When you want to make decisions for a particular patient, then it becomes more complicated. But I think in principle it should hold. But what happened in Norway was that policymakers, the ministry, they thought it would be too difficult and even not relevant to look at the past, so they changed. So in the white paper they said we should look at proportional shortfall taking all, or only uh, f the future health into consideration. But I think in principle we should always uh, care about the whole life. Okay. Uh, okay. I could yeah. try yes. as a hedonist. Yeah. Um, as a hedonist, if I care about my consciousness, right, uh, my, about my desirable consciousness, as Sidgwick would say, then I care about the past in memories. Yes, so the past is important for me because I remember it and it influences my consciousness at the very moment. Um, so that's the whole life thing. Um, of course, when we look to the future, um, we believe that we should have those desirable consciousness good as it can only be, so we plan, yes, we do, um, we do the planning because we want, for example, pleasures in the future as well as uh, now, uh, so we count the future um, as well as, uh, uh, as present, but the past is important only as far as we remember it. Would you agree? Uh, okay, my main objection in the book also against uh, egalitarian thinking, focusing on entire lives, and that goes also for Rawls' lexical idea of, of maximizing the situation for the worst of individual, is that it is, is insensitive to suffering at the moment. I mean, you could have a patient who had a, had a, a terrific life, or even make it like this. You have one person who has lived for a long time just above the level where life is worth living and garnered a lot of, of well-being because of the length of the life. So this is an extremely happy individual when you look at the entire life, even though he was just above the level. And the other guy was just below almost indistinguishable at the moment, but, but has garnered a lot of unhappiness in, in his life. And now the, the happy guy is uh, suffering terribly, by, while the, the unhappy guy is, has only mild pain. Should we really turn to this mild pain only because this person has garnered over his lifetime so much unhappiness? No, no I, I feel no real challenge in, in that objection. As I said earlier, I feel more challenge from to the prioritarian idea um, apply to moments uh, so that this person who momentarily now suffers has an extra demand on resources. Uh, it's also tricky, this notion. I mean, Rawls and egalitarians build on this idea of, of personal lives being uh, different and integrated in a sense. Uh, and the conclusion is that you can compensate within lives, but not between lives. But when you start to uh, scrutinize this idea, as Derek Parfit has done and, and many other people done, uh, it surfaces that perhaps it's not really persons we're interested in, because I may, I, you speak of memories. I, couldn't, I could easily have forgotten a lot about my earlier me. It's still me, but, but why bother with it if I not even remember it now. So then we have this idea that you should look at, at parts of the person that are sufficiently connected and there is continuity enough and so um, I think it's intellectual disaster. <laughs> Siobhan uh, O'Sullivan uh, talked about or mentioned trust and solidarity. Um, if you look at um, dignity, a dignity principle, which I read as a non-discriminatory principle, it says what you sh how you should you should avoid doing this because you are discriminating people. I think a principle of that kind can create trust and tr solidarity in society. Do you think that your utilitarian view 
create trust and solidarity in society? It's a mean question. I apologize, but <laughs> <laughs> can't resist. <laughs> We are used to it. <laughs> can I can I respond? Yeah. I was uh, once in a radio program with Torbjörn in Norwegian radio, and he said that he thought we should vaccinate the young before the old. You believe that that would be yeah, more efficient? Yeah, I've changed my mind because I yes. was wrong then. Yes, I was wrong in that. <laughs> but if suppose you were right, yeah. <laughs> you were willing to sacrifice your interest for the sake yes, of, yes, of yes, the yes. community. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it follows also a sense of solidarity if we define it as a willingness for the uh, to to promote the greater good. I'm not a utilitarian. I just wanted to be polite and defend <laughs> Torbjörn. <laughs> <laughs> no, Torbjörn moved on to taxi drivers. Yes. yes, yes. I mean, that was my idea then also, taxi yeah. drivers. Yeah, but that was because I had the belief that we could defeat the virus. Yeah. And then it would be ridiculous to vaccinate people okay. like me, I thought, mm -hmm. because I could avoid being, being, um, being uh, infected mm -hmm. uh, with my lifestyle, but, but, but the taxi driver can't. So yeah. that we should really target those groups that, that spread the virus. But now it seems that there is no way of avoiding mm -hmm. the spread of the virus. And now this harm reduction um, strategy is perhaps the best yeah. one. The she only available one. Siobhan, uh, it's difficult to be up there or, <laughs> or down uh, there. Down there, <laughs> whatever. whatever. You Why said you? something, I'm just curious how you do it. You say objective, you want objective assessment of uh, uh, severity of uh, a patient's uh, health. And how can we make an objective assessment of something so subjective? Yeah, but I think that speaks to your point, Niels Eric, about the difficulty with taking utility as your sole criterion, um, because there are so many um, uncertainties. And I completely accept Peter's argument that that's true of everything in life. And therefore, we, we have to go on the basis of probabilities. But I think it doesn't mean, and I think it comes to Ola's point that, you know, it is about trade-offs in the end of the day. So you can use utility to a certain extent, but I think utility doesn't um, take into account uh, issues like structural inequalities. And I, I think it's really interesting that we haven't discussed that so much today. So even in our discussions around mandatory vaccination policies, um, it's as if everybody who, uh, you know, everybody in society is, is making the same choices in the same set of circumstances. And that's clearly not the case. Um, so I think, uh, you know, so this idea of having one rule for everybody and just simply not recognizing that people are constrained in terms of their choices. And to your point around, um, you know, severity and so on, I think we have to, uh, you know, we are making judgments because we're required to make judgments. So we can be as theoretical as we like, but on the ground, somebody has to make the judgment about who's going to receive um, access to a particular drug or treatment or, or whatever it is. So I think it is about, and I think that's very much the way things have gone. Um, it's about utility because it's something we can't get away from because it is inherently attractive because it gives us some sort of objective criteria or in its, and in its own way, it's non-discriminatory. But I think it definitely needs this side constraint of, of equity um, and, and, and taking this whole life cycle into account. Because if we only take the suffering that's in front of us at that given moment, um, that totally ignores uh, social inequalities, structural difficulties. Um, uh, and I think that simply isn't realistic in the delivery of a public health system. Can I ask you a little bit more about what you said about the constraints that people make choices about getting vaccinated? Um, I, you know, clearly there are differences, but to describe them, as, what did you have in mind by the kind of constraints? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's really interesting. Uh, Elena talked earlier about you know the vaccination rates maybe in East Germany versus West Germany. Um, here in Ireland, we have, uh, as I said, an extraordinarily high vaccination rate, but there are certain pockets. Um, and a lot of those, for example, would be migrant workers. And it's understandable as maybe perhaps as a migrant worker, you're coming from maybe a more authoritarian state where you have less trust. 
in your government. You may not want to draw attention to yourself uh, in your new uh, in your new um, place of residence, etc. You have people who are have difficulties with health literacy, for example, and who may not be able to access information and may be much more um, susceptible to the kind of stuff that's on social media about vaccines causing infertility, et cetera, et cetera. And I also think that whole discussion about mandatory vaccination completely ignores that there are whole swathes of our population who are currently unable to access vaccines, either because they're not recommended or authorized for them, because they have medical contraindications, um, because, uh, 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 you know, pregnant women, for example, we have a lot of pregnant women who are disproportionately taking up places in ICU. Um, And yet it's completely understandable if you're in your first trimester of pregnancy that you might have more reticence, if you like, about taking a vaccine than somebody who isn't pregnant. So I think it's a very complex web of reasons. uh, And I don't think it's so easy to just lump it all in. It's just selfish people who simply won't take vaccines. I think we need to be a little bit more um, to see to see the decisions people are taking within the social context in which they're being taken. Well, I, I, I agree, for example, that we certainly need to provide information in the languages of the people in our countries. Um, and perhaps, you know, you need to make more efforts to do that. It's a, it was a similar issue in Australia. Um, I think efforts have been made. But, I, you know, beyond that, I, I, I don't see the things that you've been describing as really constraints. Um, I think they are choices that people make, um, you know, whether they believe this view or they believe the views of the, of the health authorities. Um, you know, after all, they can see that it is actually the more privileged people who are getting vaccinated. So the idea that the vaccines are going to be, you know, that they're being used as guinea pigs or something of that sort um, is surely clearly false. Um, I, I, I'm not saying they're selfish necessarily, but they need, I think they, there needs to be under more pressure or perhaps incentives, as we talked earlier, you know, offering them lottery tickets or cinema tickets or whatever it might be, um, there needs to be more to get them to make, the, to make different choices. Um, I think it is still their choices, and so I don't think constraints is really the right word. Can I make one very quick comment in respect yeah. to that? I, I, I think that we already have that, um, certainly within Europe, because we have a very... Uh, um, high uptake in terms of the use of COVID passes, which actually restrict people's ability, unvaccinated people's abilities often to access civil um, society spaces and and to access services. So we already have that. And we've done all of that, uh, you know, trying to to reach people in their own language, etc. It's much more fundamental than that. And I think that it is I think to dismiss that it's simply there, that there are those constraints. Yes, of course, they're making choices, but it's about what what is the space for those choices? And they're different choices to the choices you and I are making. And I think we need to recognize that. So I think, you know, there is some work to be done, as you say, in trying to understand the reasons. But all, I think they are constraints. Some of the issues are constraints, but we are already operating a system whereby to some extent people are being penalized um, in terms of how they can access services and public spaces. Are there any questions in the audience? Oh, good. Uh, Say your name and where you're from and uh, two questions on the road. Hi, I'm Sarah from Link Shipping University. Um, I wanted to thank everyone uh, for a great discussion. And I was, I can't help thinking um, at the risk of being Americentric that some of these issues of prioritization might be different under a largely private healthcare system like we have in the US. So for example, like in the instance of there being two patients who are equally sick and there's only one hospital bed, it wouldn't necessarily come down to number of years that they have to live or even like other healthcare issues that may come down to like what their health, like whether they have insurance and like, or how much they're able to pay. And so it's not so much needs or utility based, but like how much people are able to pay, which 
brings its own ethical issues. So I'm curious if um, anyone has any thoughts on um, like that ethical analysis that you would put into um, like a, a system like this. Ule. Yeah, my, my view is clearly <laughs> that um, universal health coverage, where we pool our resources and allocate to everyone in need, regardless of ability to pay, is more efficient and more fair. So my response is that the US system, when ability to pay determines whether you get a vaccine or get uh, access to IC, ICU unit, it's both inefficient and unfair. Strictly <laughs> speaking in the United States, if you go to an emergency room and not treating you is a risk to your life, it's illegal for the hospital not to treat you which is not to say people might not try to get around that in some ways, but, um, but that is the situation. But I, I totally agree that uh, you know, I think the, having lived in the US for many years, it's, it's a crazy, inefficient, complicated health system. Um, and you know, I'm now in Europe, so I can assume that other people agree with that uh, <laughs> assumption here. When I write about it in my book, I just assume that we discuss a, a welfare state where, where, where there is public subsidies for healthcare purposes. So I haven't even contemplated <laughs> the American way of life. Do you want to say? No, add something? No. You no, I totally you. agree. I mean, you know, I'm, I come from a socialist country, so um, <laughs> I, I be, believe me, I mean, our medical system uh, before 89 uh, was amazing, yes? I mean, every got help, um, rehabilitation was, was great, and so on. So now we are much worse um, than we were before 89, um, even if it's hard to imagine, I mean, with all the... <clears throat> all they advance in, in medicine, of course, um, but it would be much better if we had old system of medicine, especially. The second question down there. Hi, thank you. I'm Paula from Linköping University, and I have actually um, two questions. Maybe you decide which one is more appropriate. Um, so the first one is more directed to you, um, Dr. O'Sullivan, um, precisely because you mentioned that care ethics might be a different approach, a different way forward, and I was interested in hearing more about that and how that differs from utilitarianism, which we've heard quite a lot about um, today. And then secondly, I had a question about... Um, the international distribution of vaccination because so far we've talked about national um, distributive policies and I was interested in hearing your thoughts about it, but I don't know if that's <laughs> too many questions and too m much of new topics. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for the interesting debate and all the very interesting um, presentations. Um, I thought comment. Dr. Sullivan was, was, was yes, there? yes. I mean, do was she won? She was do addressed. You to, yeah. So I, I, I don't think um, utilitarianism is on its last legs, <laughs> and I think uh, we will see uh, we will see it persist into the next pandemic, and certainly in resource allocation considerations. I think equity, solidarity, are concepts that have certainly in the last decade taken hold, and I think that's reflected in national resource allocation policies. What I think is interesting, and I was trying to point to it, and I mean, that's very evident, at least in European uh, policies, um, is this extension beyond equity, or at least how we understand equity. It's, it's, it's very different. It's not one common understanding. So whatever about our understanding of maximizing utility, I think it's much more complex when we come to what we mean by equity and how we um, best achieve that. But I actually think there's something that's going on um, and it will be interesting to see how it's going to develop, which is I think going back to care ethics. And I think that care ethics is going to come up a lot more in the pandemic because I mean, we've had similar arguments as I know you've had in Sweden about restricting access, uh, for example, to, to, to older people who are living in residential care and um, asking people to, as we use the term in Ireland, which people didn't like at all, cocoon if you had an underlying condition or if you were older, for example. And I think what we didn't understand was just, so we were talking about solidarity on the one hand, which was uh, about the interconnectedness of us all. But I suppose in terms of care ethics, being very much about looking at the person in front of you, what is their need 
what do they want? Um, and that's very difficult in the concept of a public health ethical lens. And I think that's going to be the challenge for us. So we have lots of these policies which talked about um, consultation with the patient, um, ascertaining will and preferences and so on. And the will and preference of the individual isn't really necessarily in line with the whole utility calculus. So I wonder, or even an equity calculus, for that, an equity consideration for that matter. So I wonder in terms of um, and I think it kind of goes away from human dignity somehow to back to this idea of caring for the individual in front of you, taking into account their particular circumstances. And I wonder how that's going to work in a broader public health system where we have to allocate resources. So I suppose it's more it's more a question from my side. I, I think it's interesting to, to note it. And, and then just on your final question, if I'm allowed, I think it's really interesting because we've had a very, you know, so because of the scarcity issue and the value people have placed on vaccines, um, there is a huge amount of vaccine nationalism as a result of that. And of course, governments feel that they want to protect their own populations. And we've heard arguments about global equity, um, not generally on moral grounds, but more because we need to stop the emergence of variants. So it's self-preservation, et cetera, that we need to do that. It's really interesting. In Ireland, we had a discussion about we have a million of our population who've already received booster doses. And there was everybody was like, we need to have our boosters as quickly as possible. And there was some criticism of our National Immunisation Advisory Committee that they didn't go faster with advising that. Um, and then as soon as um, Omicron started to emerge, people said, oh, you see, that's the problem with giving everybody boosters. We should have been giving it away. So it's very difficult to strike the balance there between our um, equity considerations and what our responsibilities are. So in practice, people talk about global equity, but what are the responsibilities to your national, um, to your population and how governments manage that is extremely tricky. We have a question over there. Yeah, uh, hello. My, my name is Arvid Erlansson. I'm a researcher in psychology at Linköping University, and I'm very interested in this topic as well, but from the perspective of conducting experimental research on uh, how general people have the moral intuitions and the moral preferences and the moral prioritizations of general people, and how like how you can fra different framings of a situation or a solution or even just f framing the questions in a different way can affect preferences. And related to that, I wonder to what extent do you think uh, the general, like the public opinion or people's preferences in general should influence, sh should it go into the utilitarian calculus or not? Uh, for example, we were talking about whether care workers should be prioritized. If it was made a, like a national survey saying like 95% of the Swedish population think they should, should that matter when we discuss this morally? Um, all right, well, if nobody else wants to jump in. Um, yeah, I, I think it does matter. I mean, I think it matters in terms of uh, getting public support for policies, which is always good. Get, people supportive of that, um, and perhaps this is part of what uh, Dr. O'Sullivan mentioned in terms of uh, the value of, of solidarity, that the community feels it's pulling behind the workers who are at the coalface, if you like, and the front line, putting themselves at risk. Um, that's their beliefs. Now, you know, there were some reasons for questioning those beliefs that were, that were raised here today, but um, if that's their belief, then there's some value in getting them to see that we're responding to those wishes. Um, but sometimes, I suppose, if, if the beliefs are actually going to be clearly harmful um, or get in the way of doing what's the best for everyone, then it clearly doesn't get uh, ultimate weight at that point. Let me mention a problematic aspect of this, I think. Uh, it's strange that we have, we have discussed priority setting with regard to ICU beds and, and, and the vaccination, but as you pointed out, perhaps the, plat the national platform in Sweden doesn't really apply to, to all those topics. But we have also, of course, uh, the introduction of new medicines. 
And there you have uh, very strict rules about how that, that is done. And then, I mean, you do count qualis. Uh, uh, so uh, one question to, to those who don't want to apply this <coughs> way of setting priorities in other situations, why not? If it's so fine when we introduce new medication, why not go for cost effectiveness all over the board? But, but the problem you meet here is with, with orphan Medi medication, as, uh, when there are rare diseases, uh, and you could publicize these cases. There was one the other day in new Swedish newspapers with, with cystic fibrosis, uh, a woman who didn't receive medication because it was considered too expensive. Uh, and there is always a media hype around this. And, and also, I mean, always, I think, if you go out and measure it, you will have a lot of support for this view that we should make ex exceptions for those rare diseases. And they add up, all of them. And, and when you, you look at the opportunity costs uh, for ordinary diseases, and so uh, they would be terrible if you couldn't stand against that kind of, of public outrage. So, so sometimes uh, it's nice when you have support from, from, from the public for sound policies, but, but it's tricky when you get fierce opposition against what really has to be uh, the decision from authorities. So two, uh, one question here, why don't we use this method of setting priorities also uh, uh, when the pandemic strikes uh, only when, when we introduce new medications. And the other one is just the observation that, that uh, this kind of popular upraise thing could be difficult to handle and have bad effects really. They did a study on uh, the moral machine a couple of years ago and uh, rank ordered whom to save in traffic. And first was uh, women with a pram, and at the bottom, uh, people suffering from alcoholism or something like that, and white men. So, <laughs> and it gives me, uh, you ask yourself, is this good? Uh, is this the utility function that you want to program uh, into a car or something like that? And the obvious answer is. We have to think in another way. Uh, Ole, uh, I asked when I'm I talking, have I have it. So, so yeah. uh, during the morning, I got a feeling that you sometimes said, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that's a good utilitarian decision by people. They did uh, ut uh, what a utilitarian would have done, choose. Uh, I think it was when we talked about inst um, intensive care units, but I might have missed that. But, uh, you, uh, I got a feeling it indicated that people behave in a utilitarian way. I believe they tend to become more utilitarian in situations of mass casualty than they are otherwise. Yeah. Uh, when people refuse even to think about priority setting in healthcare. But as you, I think it was, you know, someone said here earlier on that, of course, we meet this. Uh, difficult decisions all the time. It's only that they are not visible in, in the uh, way they are now. So, so, that, so this is also a pedagogical uh, experiment we're in now, that uh, we must realize that we make that kind of decisions. And, and those orphan drugs, of course, points also very clearly at uh, what is at stake. Okay. Ole. I didn't have a chance to answer that question about global allocation of vaccines, okay. so if, if I may do that. So, my view is this. It's very unfortunate uh, that we don't have a, um, a global world order uh, authority to allocate vaccines. So politically, this is extremely uh, difficult. But from an ethical perspective, I think it's clearly unfair that we are in a situation here in Norway and Sweden. We are contemplating on taking the third bo booster dose, while in South Africa, a lot of people don't have access to the first dose. It's both unfair and <laughs> inefficient, I, I would argue again. But there's even a, a simpler way, yes? I, I mean, if Pfizer and so on would give away um, the rights to vaccines, we would be all saved. So, well, um, I don't think it's that, uh, it's not that easy simple. because of you need the technology simple, transfer and so on. But they've already got yes. so much money I yes, agree, that, I agree. Uh, that mm. it's time for us really to fight and, yeah. uh, and to argue that we should release the rights to vaccines.
Um, I, I certainly agree with, with those comments, but it, it's not in a way surprising because it's been part of the international situation with, with uh, aid, for example, um, that you know, there are organizations, I uh, co-founded an organization called The Life You Can Save that recommends charities that are particularly effective at saving lives in low-income countries. And there are organizations you can donate to right now who can save a life for around $5,000. Um, whereas in the United States, of course, it costs hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to save a life through the, the healthcare system on average. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing with the maldistribution of uh, vaccines is simply a continuation of a, what's been a standing situation uh, around the world for a very long time. With those words, I think we should end the day. And uh, again, Torbjörn, congratulations and thank yes. you for organizing this uh, fantastic mm. day and uh, bringing people from around the world in Europe here. So thank you very much and all the speakers, thank you very much mm. wherever you are, on the screen in the uh, island or sitting in the room here and we give each other a huge applause and thank you very much. <laughs>